Okay, now welcome to class. Should be recording. Did I click record? Okay, good. We're recording. Um, thank you for all of your comments and things like that in our in our quiz. It's very helpful to get to know you a little bit. I did read all of them as long as you submitted me for last time. I didn't read the ones from today yet. Um, some of the feedback that we have so far is to use my slides more, which is good advice. And let's see, what are the things that we have as recommendations for class? So if you want to, to get to know our classmates more, we kind of skipped over that a little bit. So maybe, maybe let's just do something brief where we go around, say your name, your major, and your, your career goals slash internship or job opportunities that you're either have secured or are exploring. That worked? Did we already do this? I don't think we did, right? Because we didn't share our, our majors. Okay, we'll start with Bonnie on the front row, and we'll just go around. Okay, awesome. I don't know how well that's ever Uh they are related. Um, maybe I'm not sure how Big Four is broken down in EY if that's a, a jump, but definitely once you get out, there's like in our firm we have data analytics and risk assurance is kind of in the same group. So all right. Michael. Yeah? I'm Michael Chapman. Uh, about our major and kind of our career okay. aspirations. Um, I'm an IS major as well. Um, and I would also like to go to something more for risk assurance or tech advising or um, I also have to do uh, Southwest. So, that. Very nice. Awesome. Okay, moving up to the top row. Uh, my name is Anthony Musso. Uh, I'm an accounting major. Um, I have an internship with Deloitte in Boston, an auto practice. Awesome, perfect. Uh, Joe Lee from Southern California. Um, I'm also an attorney. So you are the chief engineer. Okay, perfect. I'm Kyle Harleen from Northwest Pilot in Glasgow University. I'm an IS major. Uh, I've also been interested in doing a trip with all the big four. I plan to apply for the master's in science, and so this year would be the summer leadership program I apply for the internship next year. And uh, one of my backgrounds is IT, and I think that's the direction I'm headed with, with IT infrastructure and IT consulting and things like that. Awesome. I'm Jimmy Dawson. I'm a junior in the program. I'm Kenny Adams. I'm a junior in accounting. I'm working with audit and reporting. Okay. I'm Jenner Berry Clark from Southern California. I'm a junior in the accounting program. I'm working with audit with some of the We're, we're just saying our major and our name and kind of where we're going with our, our career. So, yeah, okay. we'll go back to her. My name is Amy and I'm a junior in the accounting program. I have an internship with uh, a company called Deloitte. 
Okay, perfect. Going back to this side. Oh, okay, uh, I'm Wendy, uh, junior core, and I have an internship with Deloitte this summer. Awesome, where at? San Francisco. San Francisco, very nice. Okay, all right, back to Sterling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what would you want to do with Microsoft? More IT stuff, project management, or accounting related? Uh, not totally. <coughs> I just really like the company. I like the product. I'm a PC, I guess, like the old commercial. Okay. Very nice. Thomas? Yes, I am in, in accounting. I have an internship with PwC and risk assurance in Portland this summer. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to. Help you bail out if you need to. Yeah. Makes sense. I'm Translator. I'm a teacher with the Deloitte in your cyber practice in Seattle. Awesome. Perfect. Back row. Um, I'm Shelby. I just got back from San Francisco and I work in full time in Seattle, actually, as well as in advisory. Uh, I'll be a little pressure and I'll be a Okay. Awesome. Okay. Did you have a question? Or? Oh, wow, so you guys can like work in the same office? Very nice. I swear in my singles ward when I was at BYU, like half the people were from Washington. Not necessarily Seattle, but like Washington was everywhere. So, have you guys noticed that like a state outside of Utah seems to dominate your classes or whatever? Is there a popular one nowadays? California? Is everyone from California? Okay. Looks like all the Washington people graduated. Okay. So, all right. Search of thought. Quick story. This is, I call it the Golden Buddha story. Um, in mid century, somewhere between 1500 and 1700, I think, uh, this town in Thailand had a Golden Buddha statue. Huge Golden Buddha statue. I think it's about nine feet tall, hundreds of pounds, pure gold. Um, kind of the pride of the town. Uh, so there for who knows how long before invaders were coming to, and they were kind of sweeping through the country, the townspeople heard about it, and they decided they were going to cover up their crown jewels so that they wouldn't be scattered, more or less. So what they did is they covered it up with mud and stucco, and so that when the invaders came, they wouldn't know what it was. They just did the clay statue. Turned out to work very well. Uh, invaders came, ended up winding down the village. Nobody lived to tell the tale of the Golden Buddha statue. Invaders didn't know it existed, and the story died. And this statue stayed in the middle of that town square for hundreds of years, undetected, and what a time it was. Until in the 1950s, uh, people had moved back into the town and they had to do some infrastructure changes. They decided they were going to move it to a different location, and in doing so, tipped off some of the clay. Realized that there was gold underneath, and that never happened. But they did figure out what it was. They took off all the, off all the mud, and made it look pretty. And here's the spiritual application. Um, I think with ministering, the way that the church is ministering now, it's a golden opportunity. It's a golden opportunity to serve. It's a golden opportunity to develop relationships, and have spiritual experiences. However, um, when we don't report it here as often, we don't have somebody calling us and saying, how are our families here as frequently? We're not reporting on a monthly basis. It can become one of those opportunities that gets buried. Um, so my invitation to you is to look for that golden opportunity. Don't let it get buried. OK, scoping follow-up. First slide of every class is basically, uh, I go back, look through the lecture, realize that I missed some stuff or didn't explain some stuff very well. And I also look at test questions, intent to see what I need to flesh out a little bit. So here are four points that 
I think can help us understand a little bit more about scoping. First off, what systems are typically in scope for a financial model? This is going to be your systems that have both material information, or sorry, material financial statements, material financial statement information in them, material amounts of money are flowing through them, as well as systems that have controls around them. There could be a system that is really important, but they don't have any information system controls around it. And so you can't rely on that system from an audit standpoint. You have to do substantive testing for that system. For example, the point of sale system, Walmart, they have their cashier registers. It's really hard to get logical access around those. And so they punt to other ways of getting comfort around the financial information flowing through that system. Some systems, they just don't have enough money flowing through them to care. Uh, example might be equity. Some systems will have, uh, you know, shares. They want to pay their CEO in shares of the company or uh, executive level management with their shares, but maybe that isn't material, and so they don't care. They don't scope it in. Um, okay, who determines which systems are in scope? This one might be a surprise because I did not explain this very well. I kind of just said, here's some systems, right? So the way that you determine which systems are in scope is the financial auditors are, will take their financial statements, they get all their numbers, and we'll say we have depreciation, okay? $7,000 of depreciation. I don't even know if I'm spelling this right. $7,000 of depreciation, they're like, aha, how did you get this number? That's an important number. Oh, it's coming out of our uh, asset management system, okay? Then we're going to scope in asset management. The asset management system, AMS. I'm making this up, by the way. I'm not even sure if that's real system. Um, then they say, okay, we have this another number. Let's say it's uh, $30,000 worth of inventory is currently in stock. They say, hey, where's this number coming from? Oh, it's coming from a report out of High Jump, our inventory system. They say, okay, well, that's an important number. Scope in High Jump. Second step is the risk assurance specialists, the IT auditors. We'll go and test the general IT application or general IT controls over these systems. If they fail, they say you cannot rely on this system. You have to find other ways to get comfortable with this information. If they pass, then they are scoped in. Okay? So primarily, the financial auditors are the ones who decide which systems are in scope. Then secondarily, IT auditors will say yay or nay. Make sense? Good. What is materiality? Go ahead. Question? Yeah, traditional autos, okay? So, and I make that designation because I deal with a lot of IT auditors and the guys who are doing actual financial statement audits, I call financial auditors. We're all external auditors, technically. So we're working for KPMG, working on a you know, public client. Um, but yeah. I, I will refer to them as financial auditors. What is materiality? Go ahead. Quick question. Um, okay. Um, okay. So the IT auditors, what if uh, financial auditors, they're like, here's what we think is in scope, but they missed one. IT auditors go back and look. Then maybe assumption should be that one Great question. And actually, that does happen. Like, the IT auditors will get in there and they'll be like, wait a second. There's like this entire other system. How did you guys miss this? Like it's a, we'll say it's like a share drive or something like that. How'd you miss this? And that does happen. They'll go back and make a recommendation. Um, ideally, when they're doing their walkthroughs of figuring out where this information co is coming from, an IT auditor will be present so they can kind of throw in their two cents because that does happen. Unfortunately, sometimes it happens really late in the process. And so then all of a sudden you have to work late nights to test all the stuff around it. Mm -hmm. But yes. Great comment. Anything else? Any other comments, questions? Okay. Materiality is if it's important. Okay. That's that's my conclusion. Material equals importance. So if we were auditing my financial statements of my house, 
five bucks is going to be important. I'm going to say five bucks. I have had a lot. But if we're looking at Walmart, it could be a million bucks. Two million bucks. They could be missing two million dollars and we wouldn't care as auditors. Simply because it's just not worth our time. We're not going to dive too much into materiality. You'll probably learn more about that in your audit classes if you're a financial if you want to do financial statement audits, but it's important to know what materiality means when we're talking about it. Okay. Now, oops. Okay, these are common systems. You'll be expected to know what these are. I'll refer to them throughout the lecture. Uh, we have hosting, AWS. Has anybody not heard of AWS? Okay, you guys make me feel so much better. It was six months into my career, and I asked my coworker, I was like, what is AWS? And he looked at me, he's like, you don't know what AWS is? I didn't. So AWS is a hosting service. They, you, if you want to uh, develop an application, all that, all that data has to sit somewhere, right? You can have it sit on your computer, but then you have people pinging your computer as they use your app. Or you can hire someone else like AWS, do that for you. So I'm going to refer to AWS somewhat frequently. A surprisingly large amount of companies use AWS as a hosting service. Amazon Web Services, yes. Um, they, they're an infrastructure as a service. Technically, they're also, uh, they have other layers in there as well. Um, but at a very base layer, they're infrastructure as a service. Um, Azure is a competitor to AWS, not near as common, but pretty much the same thing. Uh, oops, sorry. And then there's like Google Cloud, which is even a smaller competitor. Now, if they're grayed out, I put them there so you can familiarize with yourself, but I don't expect you to memorize it. I do expect you to memorize the other systems because I don't want you to look dumb like I did. In my in my internship, actually, I was like, I think I was full time at that point. I was at a recruiting event here at BYU, and I asked my coworker that, and pardon me. All these other systems are important to know, and the reason that these are important to know is because you're probably going to go to a client and they don't use uh, High Jump as their inventory system, but they'll come out with some like weird name. Pizzazz. And you're like, what's Pizzazz? You're like, oh, it's an inventory system, kind of like high jump. You're like, oh, I know what high jump is. Okay? But if they start listing off systems, they're like, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like play velocity or paychecks, and you're like, yeah, I haven't heard of those either, then it just kind of crumbles away at your reputation. So, so try and uh, memorize all these. We'll have some questions on the test reflecting these, and then also the test questions, we'll just use these systems inherently. Okay? Last column, equity management. That I, we didn't talk about the equity management when we were doing our scoping. I kind of realized afterwards. So equity management is important. It, it does get scoped in somewhat frequently. Okay. Go ahead. Question. Uh, how do you pronounce the second item listed under inventory systems? Inventory systems. A seller. I think so. Yeah. That's how my client referred to it, but sometimes they <laughs> they call things wrong too. Uh, we will dig into a lot of these different areas. For example, operating systems we'll get into a little bit more later, and maybe even today. And then Active Directory and Okta, we'll dig into and ticketing systems. I don't think we've really dug into these a whole lot, but it's coming. It's coming. Whew. Okay, logical access. This is the first area of... Oh, wait a second. I think I missed one of our main areas here. Okay. You guys probably had, did you guys see that question on the quiz where it says, what, what types of controls are common among all IT audits? Not a good question. I looked at that, I was like, eh, this is a bad question. So I went and changed everyone's grade who had missed it to give them a point. Um, the, what I was going for is general IT, or general IT controls. Those are kind of pervasive. They include logical access, change management, and a couple other areas. You're going to see those in every audit. The application controls that I have in there, um, that, that's kind of focused on financial audits, but verbiage is 
could be common across other uh, audits as well. But the answer I'm looking for is general IT controls, such as logical access. Okay, let's go to an example. <sighs> what is logical access? Student folder. I'm going to do a quick example of who we want to have access to stuff. We have our A students, we have our B students, and C students. I've already decided who's going to be an A student, who's going to be a B student, C student. I did a randomized formula. I think so. What's that? What? No, there is stuff in here. There better be stuff in here. I put it in there last night. So, like, we have our final answer key. So, what I was thinking is, like, I'll just put it in an Excel spreadsheet, make this super easy. Third of my students get A, B, and C, and then I'll give them access to these folders, and they can do what they want. So, we have, like, our answer key here, midterm. Don't look too long. You get three seconds. One, two, three. Then we have student folder. Okay, B. Okay. B students, when I was a B student at school, it's usually because I bombed a test or something, and I go pleading for extra credit. So I was like, okay, we'll just give them extra credit right here. So here's our extra credit assignments. I think I put some, some stuff that we could do. Why, well, is your favorite class? Five pages. Lots of extra credit, though. And don't like all my stuff. <laughs> This is this is high quality entertainment, guys. Okay, and then C students. If you're a C student, then okay, parties in your main. So I actually went and grabbed this screenshot yesterday. From uh, took me three seconds. I went and looked at BYU activities. Look at this. A copyright working group. You guys better not miss this. That is. Oh wait, that was yesterday. You guys already missed it. But what was that? It was lit. It was lit. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so so different permissions. Now, the reason I share this with you is I didn't have any financial data, but this could be applicable. Um, just just think about the risks. If what are the risks of giving the wrong data? What, what could go wrong? That's actually like an official term when we're doing risk analysis. What could go wrong with giving people the wrong types of data? So maybe talk amongst yourselves. And let's, let's brainstorm a list of risks to giving the wrong access. And we don't have to talk about like financial data. This could be just like, if this was learning suite, and I and this actually was how you're getting the grades, or what could happen? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're just listening. What could what could happen if if we didn't have? Okay, so you could operate off of the wrong information. Okay, so misuse of the information. Is that maybe? Is that how you spell misuse? Okay. Uh, I'm going to call it privilege, okay? Privilege. Let's try it over to bad handwriting. Okay, yeah, thank you. Misuse of privilege. Uh, misusing the information. So, for example, if you're an accountant and you have access in Oracle to, um, to financial data that you shouldn't have access to, maybe you're an intern and you can see uh, what the financial numbers are for the next month, then you should have that data, but maybe not. Maybe... Maybe that's a misuse of information. Maybe you take that home, tell all your classmates, and y'all have insider trading problems the next day. Okay, that's good. What else could go wrong? Loss of data. Perfect. Specifically, I'm going to tell you a quick story. 
at the article, I'll probably put it in there and make it required reading. Um, an employee, he was a, a, an infrastructure engineer, he gets fired. They do not remove his access within like a week, and he goes and deletes all of the servers in their AWS instance. Huge problems. I think, I don't know all the details, I'll have to go read the article again, but I think what happened was is luckily they had some backup files, and so they were able to spin everything back up and get everything running, but huge losses for the week or so that they were down, or you know, data, whatever. So yes, loss of data. Not just, uh, go ahead. Not just, not just losing data like on your servers, but manipulation of your data. Actually, dang it, I just blew another one. <laughs> so, uh, like overriding your data, and so it's gone now. It's like, okay. And I guess, listen, dang it, will it? Changing data, manipulating data. Okay, so you have. You have administrative privileges to your payroll account, and you don't like your salary, so you just kind of open up a little bit. Also, you're a happy employee, right? So, those are those are the three that I was mostly aiming at. Um, okay, so I kind of want to like hide this and make sure I'm not missing anything. Eh, I'll probably miss something. That's okay. Okay, so how can we stop this? Now we've kind of thought of a couple things, pretty short list, right? We're not going to get into too much of the minutiae yet, but let's think about how we can keep this from happening. We're going to design some controls. What can we do so that we don't have people misusing data that you shouldn't have, deleting data that we care about, and manipulating data? We don't want those B students going in and giving themselves A's. Go ahead, Thomas. Yes, perfect. Okay, so this is, uh, we call these permissions, okay? And not, this isn't necessarily a control in itself, but it is the way that data is, uh, or how systems, we should have this listed somewhere. Okay. So yes, we can. We have uh, privileges, is how I'll refer to these, or permissions. Okay. So for example, new tax accountant, he's going to get access to Oracle, but not all of Oracle. We only want him to see tax module one and manipulate tax module seven over something. Okay. Nothing else. We don't want him doing anything else. And so he doesn't get any other permissions. He doesn't get the permission to uh, delete or to see tax modules two through five, okay? Permissions. Now, this can get hairy really fast because there's thousands of different permissions in some of these ERP systems, specifically Oracle and SAP. You're looking at thousands of different permissions to this screen or this ability, okay? So if I'm a new employee and I need 47 of those, if I'm the, if you're the administrator, you're gonna get pretty annoyed having to go through and click yes, click yes, no, no, yes, no, yes, 3,000 times. So what they did, because they're geniuses, is they decided we're just gonna create roles. And these roles are just a set role. I'm a new accountant, okay, then you're gonna get the accountant one role, okay? I've been out for two years in the big four, now I'm done. Okay, now then you are going to get the accountant two rules, different permissions, right? So rules contain permissions. And this is kind of a, a generic privilege, okay? Now there's other cases where that rule, the rules aren't enough, and so we kind of do a hybrid, okay? That's the third one. The hybrid where it's a combination of you get your role, but then you get added some permissions, maybe subtracted some permissions, okay? You get, you're not quite ready to be promoted, so we're going to add a bunch of permissions, and then we'll promote you and we'll take away from you, right? I've seen it both ways, okay? That is, that's more or less how, how access is, is divvied up within an application. Um, now, 
there's three different layers within our IT system, right? We have our applications, which were, you know, Oracle, we have payroll system, One, two, three. So here's our app layer. Then we have our database layer. And then we have our server layer, or our operating system layer. Okay? Database layers, usually we have, there's four permissions. There's create, delete, execute, ah, not delete, 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 execute, and 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 read read only, I think. I have a slide for it. Don't get me saying. Okay. And then OS layer is basically like either you're an admin or you just kind of have access to what's sitting on that operating system. Okay. Might be an oversimplification, but for this class, that's that's probably where our brains would be. Okay. Uh. Okay, but now that is not an actual control. That's just the way that they divvy it up. Then we have on top of that controls, which are the things that the company does. The people within the company perform these controls or they set up their system to perform uh, procedures so that we can limit access. I'm going to give you the first one just to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit. The first one is provisioning that access. Okay, so new, new person to the company, they don't just go and give themselves the access, right? They need to get permission from their manager, then the assistant administrator has to set it up, and then they get their access. So that's one of the controls that's in place. What other controls, maybe talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes, what other controls could you imagine the company putting in place? To limit logical access. Many multiple people give permission. Yes, uh huh, and that's that's definitely true. Um, now that, that's going to fall underneath the provisioning control, but yes, that is one component of of provisioning. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, I don't know if this is uh, the same type, like, same type of, but um, sometimes there's like, you know, the address to write from the screen uh, location, providing to certain databases or network applications. Okay. Um, yes. So maybe you have an assigned machine. Okay. Yes. So what we call this is that, uh, um, from a logical standpoint, you guys know what I mean when I say logical? This is like computer computer level. There's like physical level, like I walk into the building and I have access, and logical is I type into your network and I have access, okay? So the way that they do this logically is through unique, unique IDs. So everybody has a specific ID so that if I walk into Oracle, per se, they know exactly who I am. And they assign me those permissions, okay? So unique IDs, perfect. Gotta know who you are. And that's another reason that we utilize the single authentication, like the double authentication. Yes, multi-factor authentication is perfect. Okay. So and that that actually is a control. So um, passwords and MFA. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Perfect, yes. Okay, perfect. So, for example, I just left the company. How long are you going to let me have access? That's usually very well defined. 24 hours. Within 24 hours, if your access is not turned off, then we start chopping heads, okay? So, we call that termination. Termination access. Also, there's change of access. It's kind of a provisioning access. It's kind of a combination of these two. A change of access control. So 
you just got promoted from account from an accountant position to now you're the CFO. Well, your permissions would probably be different. Rather than rather than procuring the the inventory, you're going to approve the inventory. If you have both of those permissions, then we have a segregation of duties issue because then you can send out the order and approve it, and it can come to your house and and I have skis or whatever. Okay. So yes, change of access is another control. I have a question. Is there always one person that has all access to the, do everything within the system? Yes, there is. These are called administrators. Now, there's different levels of administrators, but ultimately, there's always going to be a guy who can do anything. And you have to be like trusted, I guess. Like, yes. Like, you can do everything. Like, yes. Like, 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 the end all be all is just like trust within the organization. Admin access. So this is actually control. And it's kind of a weird control. Because like the permissions one, you're probably like, wait, it's, permissions should be a control, right? A password's a control. That's to be a control because it's a button, right? I can see why you're saying that. Administrators is kind of a similar control. Because companies are like, so here's here's what happens. The big four uh, and anyone, uh, the auditors, I should say, care a lot about administrators. They're like, these guys can do anything. They could take this entire thing down if they get mad. We we care about these admins who can orchestrate over these systems. So we want to see them. That's, we're making that a control. We're going to make you review that list, and we're going to review that list to make sure it makes sense. And they're like, that's not really even a control, though. It's just something that is. Okay? Controls are usually something that's being enforced or being uh, performed. right? Nevertheless, it kind of became a control just out of, out of people caring. Right? The auditors stress out about this stuff. So they're like, no, nope, that's admin access. We don't care if it doesn't really make sense as a control. We're still going to look at it. And we're going to test it. Okay? So, yeah. Good question. Any other controls come to mind? How about if there's a mistake? What if they forget to remove someone's access? Or they give someone too much access? And they... They didn't know about it. Anyway, we can keep that from happening or to catch it. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, backup data. You need to have your backup data so that if you have an employee go rogue, you can go back. That is a control. It's not a logical access control, but we will talk about that. Um, go ahead. Yes, and, and to that point, so there's two there's two controls that kind of come out of this. Like we have these rules, and then we look at people's data. The first one is an access review. Okay, every quarter we're going to go and make sure that people's access makes sense. If you're an accountant, we want to make sure you have the accountant one rule, or you know one of people's account rules. Or that your permissions on top of that makes sense. Or if you're terminated and you still have access, we want to shut that down immediately, right? So access review, that's one. And another one is the permissions review. Because sometimes things shift in your company. You have this accountant one rule, and then you merge with another company, and they don't have an accountant one rule, so you kind of just blend them. You, know, you, you blend the, your accountant one rule, and they have a... Uh, a uh, finance role in their system. So you blend those permissions, all of a sudden they have too much permission, right? Or or maybe the job title just shifts as you go along. Accountant one role, um, but now all of your accountants are kind of more experienced, Nobody, you haven't had turnover, so they're getting more responsibility. But then all of a sudden they don't need some other access. So we need to go through and review these permissions the roles, let's review the roles and see if all of these permissions actually make sense. Do we need to cut out access? Do we need to add access to these roles? So is this basically like you're self-auditing your own company and then the auditor come in and review like what you're reviewing within your company? Because it sounds yes. like you're just like going back and reviewing all of these access controls, which is like you're just auditing what you put that access to and what's not. Then the auditors come in and say, okay, like you guys did this correctly or you didn't do this. Yes, everything you just said is true. So 
these 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 reviews, the access review and the permissions review, they're kind of an internal audit. If you're if you want to do internal audit, this is probably something that you're going to handle. And you can get tomorrow. If you have a huge company, you have to orchestrate this. It's pretty time consuming. So yeah, it is kind of, it is an internal audit function. Okay, we have a pretty healthy list here. We don't have to hit all of them, but I think it's healthy to. Um, brainstorm, what are the risks and how can we mitigate that? So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to focus just on provisioning for a minute, okay? Um, kind of give a brief overview of, of, of what provisioning is. But now, let's look at how we test it. Mission okay. rules, okay. Okay, so here's our list of, of controls that we're going to go over, at least these. I don't think we missed any. I think we got them all. Okay, we already talked about our different layers, and then some of the uh, access rights within each of these layers. Now, I spent some time on database layer. Honestly, that one isn't covered overly often. Typically, you have... DBAs or database administrators, and they kind of either have access or they don't. It gets pretty pretty nasty because these are these privileges are uh, pr uh, granted at the table level, typically, and there's thousands of tables, and so the database layer isn't audited too specifically. They're like, are you a DBA? Okay, then that makes sense for you to have basically all this access to the database. Okay. But the permission, uh, the application layer, that's hit very hard, especially in a finance audit, okay? Uh, okay, ah, I missed one thing. What is the difference between this and this? So if we look at this, it's all the same data, but what's the difference? Yes, exactly, okay? So there's a huge difference between systems that we have within our company that are sitting in our data center and, that, and systems that are third party, okay? And we, talk, we brushed on this a little bit, okay? Um, there's, there's not three layers of, of, of your system if it's hosted by a third party. You don't have a database. Third party is gonna take care of that. You don't have an operating system. Third party takes care of that. All that matters is the application, the login into that, that system. So how do we make sure that the provider isn't messing with our stuff on the back end, isn't changing our salaries, giving us pay cuts? It's annoying. Yes, this is suck. Extra credit. I need to take notes. I need to put in some extra credit here. Okay, yes, so it's a soft report, okay? So, so Paylocity, they're based out of, we'll say it's Chicago, we're here in Utah, and as auditors, it's not worth our time to go out and audit Paylocity, nor does Paylocity want 50 different sets of auditors from all 50 clients. So what they say, they're like, hey, look, we'll just hire a set of auditors. They'll come and audit our systems to make sure that they have logical access and all this good stuff that you want, and then they'll issue a report and say, yeah, it looks good. Then the auditors will come and take a look at that, and... Sign off. All right. All right. If the report's good, then we're okay with Paylocity. Okay. And I think I have that here, right here. Stock report review. Now, the reason I didn't put it in the original logical access controls is because this is not just for logical access. We want to see all the controls are there. Okay. Um, and it's also a very boring part of our job to actually have to review these reports. They're like a hundred pages long. A uh, very Annoying details. It's the worst part of my job. Um, okay, now we're going to speak, speak specifically to provisioning. We're going to so now for the rest of this class and next class, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through each of these controls. We're going to explain how uh, how they are performed at the company, and then what we will look at as auditors. Okay, we want to test these controls for Walmart. So how do we do that? What do we gather and what happens when we run into roadblocks, okay? 
each of these roadblocks that we'll get to came directly from my personal experience and I had to go to my manager and ask. You will not. You'll tell your manager how to do it and then you get promoted in your first year. That'll be impressive. Okay, access provisioning. Okay, permissions, roles, we already talked about that. Risks, we talked about. Okay, so the risks associated with access provisioning specifically are the new users obtain access without permission. Okay, your first day is on Monday and then you have unlimited access. Who said that you could have that, you know? You just got it. Someone needs to look at it and say, no, we aren't going to give him access to delete everything. Okay, so quick story. When I was working for KPMG, we had this audit class, a massive audit class. Thousands of hours of work are typed up in these files. And at the end of the audit, I was going through a process to kind of more or less uh, archive this file. And actually, I don't know if it was clear at the end of the audit yet. I think maybe I was trying to pull up. Anyway, clicking through buttons, and a big box pops up in the system. It says, do you want to delete this file? And it actually gave me an option, yes or no. And I, I was shocked. I was like, I kind of want to click yes, just to see what happens. I did not click yes, and I never found out if it was like, haha, you don't have access or something like that. Nice try. But that's a scary thought, right? You don't want people who just barely start to have access to delete your entire file, okay? So that's another risk, is too much access. Um, let's see, new user obtains more access than authorized without permission, or, or even if you get access before you, you are authorized to get that access. Those are all three risks that come about specifically with this control. This control should mitigate all three of those risks, okay? Um, so here's the normal process. You're onboarded onto the company, and the recruiter or the hiring manager who sets you up in payroll will send it out to your send out to your manager uh, an email or a ticket. It should be a ticket, okay? Now, a ticket is more or less an email. The ticketing system is just requests. How are you guys familiar with ticketing systems at all? Anyone care to explain it in your own words? It's a bunch of requests, okay? I need access to this. Uh, bring me a pop. Not really. But like, it's just a bunch of requests and then fulfilling those requests. Okay? And so the hiring manager will send a, a request to uh, the system administrator saying, hey, uh, Professor Holt just started today. He needs access to Learning Suite. Can you help get him set up? And then the system administrator does not set you up. They wait until the manager signs up and says, yes, that is the access they need. They are in that job role, okay? Then the system administrator can set it up, set up your access, and close the ticket, all right? System administrators are not necessarily your manager. It could be the IT help desk. It could be um, an IT engineer, but the per they are not the approver, okay? Um, and I've seen where Sometimes the help desk it is the system administrator. Sometimes they're just routing the ticket to the appropriate system, appropriate system administrators. Okay. Clear as mud. Doesn't have to be super clear at this point. We're gonna we're gonna start digging into what we actually do to test this. Yes, uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh, yep, and, and you can route it. You can route this ticket to say, hey, you guys can look at it, but only this person can approve it. Um, okay. It has some... Yeah, there's some access controls within the ticketing system. It acts as... Um, it helps operationally to, to help facilitate requests but also, it's very important for an audit trail. Right. They need to retain the tickets, which I mean, it's just, just like it. Yeah. And so that when the auditors come and say, hey, prove this, they pull up the ticket and say, look, we have this approval here, we have this approval here, etc. cetera. Okay? Um, now, the process I just explained to you about how access is provisioned, that's kind of a generic way of setting up the control. If, you can set up however you want, but... The principle is that you have two eyes looking at the access before it's granted to you. 
Okay. Okay, so how would we test this? Now, now we're not the company anymore. We're the auditors. We're coming in. We want to make sure that Walmart has this control in place. So what do we need to do as auditors to test the operating effectiveness of this control? What would you get? Go ahead, Mark. Yes, perfect. Okay, so let's list the things that we're going to request. All right, Walmart, we need a, a list of all your new employees. That is perfect. Okay, from that list, we're going to select a sample because we do not want to test all 7,000 new employees at Walmart. We'll look at 30. Okay, select a sample, and then what do we want to see? Thomas. Perfect. So what, what would we need to, to verify that? What was that? Okay, yeah, so potentially potentially they have some kind of matrix that they're using to assign roles, okay? Um, they call it a pre-approval matrix, where usually it's when you have less sophisticated systems, so you have like a spreadsheet, and they're like, all right, if you're an accountant, one, you're pre-approved to have this, this role and this permission, right? So it could be a pre-approval matrix, let's put this back. Okay, what else could we look at? Go ahead. Yes, so that, that will be part of the, the audit process is a walkthrough. We'll actually cover, we'll, we'll walk through an entire audit um, in three or four, uh, six, seven days, weeks. Um, but yes, <laughs> so... But that is one of the steps is we want to walk through an example of one. Okay, show us what it is. And then from that, we're going to request certain documents. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. We want to make sure that the approvers are appropriate, right? Okay. Um, and that will be um, a, a current employee list. You can look and see if that's better. Actually, they're not sure or not. Um, that also might be punted to. No, I, I think I think that's fine. So we'll, we'll want to look at the current employee list to make sure that the approvers are appropriate. Because this is where the managers will be. They probably will be in the new employee list, right? Sometimes it's the same thing. We just get a list of every employee, their hire date, their termination date. If they aren't terminated yet, that counts blank. But yes, we want to make sure the managers are appropriate. Um, and where's that approval documented? The tickets, right? So we get our sample, and one of two things happen. Either they're pre-approved for something, or there's tickets. And we want to see the tickets for those people. There we go. OK. And then the final step is we want to see what actually was set up. They were pre-approved for, or they were either pre-approved or their manager approved the accountant one role within Oracle. Well, now let's go to Oracle and see if that's actually what they got or if they got a different role, okay? So then we get system lists. We verify that their approved access was actually what was granted, okay? Okay, so now I, I left out the pre-approval matrix and the current employee list because because the heart of it is that we want to see that these new employees had approval for the role that they were granted although this is also good i should probably add this into the slides okay all right scenario you're an auditor this is your very first day you've been asked to assess the provisioning control you got this information now you're looking at tickets here's what you see in the ticket
So he asked for Susie's ticket. And what you see in there is one comment from Susie's manager that says, please set this person up with an accountant three role. That good enough? Why not, Thomas? So what if you look at the list and that actually was what they received? Okay, perfect, okay. So, before I say perfect, that's exactly what I thought when I went down this road. I call it an exception. My manager told me no. And here's why. So, and this is what he said. He's like, hey, look, so if in the ticket, the appropriate approver is the one who requests the access in the first place, it's kind of an implicit approval. And so it's like, we're just gonna count that as the approval on the day that they requested the access from the system admin. I was like, ah, oh, fine. I thought I found something. I thought I was like a hero. Nah. But, but yeah, so that actually is okay. As long as we can see that the manager either approved it or requested it, and then the system administrator, someone separate from them, granted it, two eyes are on, the, on that access, then it's gonna be okay. Do you have a question? Okay, so and actually that's a good point, okay? Um, and, and maybe the term new hire is a little deceptive. Everyone is a new hire when they come to the company. So a lot of you are gonna go to the big four, a lot of you will get sick of it anywhere between two days in and 20 years in. And you're going to leave for a very sweet job. Um, and so maybe if, if you leave after three years, you're going to be pretty experienced. So they're just going to hook you right up with the account of three role and you're going to have four people underneath you. But you're still going to be considered a new hire, at least by these definitions. But yeah, that is kind of odd. Have I, told, I haven't told you guys this. Have you guys noticed that the big four don't seem to have like a great paycheck. Like they give you an offer and it seems pretty small. It used to bug me until I realized it dawned on me one day. Going to the big four and to a lot of these companies is a lot like a residency. So a doctor, all this school, then they go out to a residency for three years where they're just kind of working alongside somebody and they get a stipend of like $50,000. Then they make big bucks. Pretty similar to Big Four. The Big Four is kind of your residency into a sweet job like CFO or controller. Lots of crazy hours, but you're working alongside people and you get something nice on your resume. I've seen a lot of job applications that only consider big companies like the Big Four, Los Adams, and Grand Ford. And then if you go to a smaller firm, they, they don't care as much. So there is something to be said for going to the Big Four or even just public accounting in general. Just a just a kick there that is probably worth it. Now it's not necessarily for everyone because it is crazy, but there are reasons for it. And it's because you're probably gonna be making a big bank later. Um okay, so yeah. Scenario one, we're good. That access was okay. Here's another scenario. Very similar, but they don't specify the access. They just say set them up like James Golden. Who's James Golden? We look on the employee list. He's there. That's all the comment says. Susie's manager is killing us. <laughs> is this good enough? What do you think, Mark? I feel like it's not in this case because depending on the state, I'm capable of this, but it's not Ah, so the question is, what if we look and we see that James Golden access is different than this person because James Golden got promoted, which has happened? Good question. Yes. And that, that's very true. It's not very specific. What if there is? That happens. You get some of these big companies and there are multiple people. That gets hairy. That's annoying. 
Okay. So, any other comments? Beautiful analysis. And actually, so that's, go ahead. What was that? Yeah. Uh -huh. And actually, I do see this most often when it is kind of a hybrid, or if it's just permissions. Like sometimes it's like 45 permissions, they don't have roles. And so it's just like this long list. Ugh, it's annoying. But yes, that's a very good point. Did you have a comment? No. Okay. So the answer is actually that it's okay because of that reason. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these people, they're, they don't care very much about controls. So they do it out of necessity. And like you said, sometimes it's like, I don't know if it's, I don't know what James, he's going to be doing what James does. What, 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 son of a like James, right? And then the system admin can go and be like, okay, well, James has this role. So I'm just going to give them that role and those permissions that James has, right? So it turns out that this is okay. Again, I went to my manager. I was like, hey, I found another one. He's like, no, you didn't. Go back to the front. Okay? But you guys will know. You'll know how this works. Okay? So it's a little – we like it to be very um, clean as auditors. We like it to say, give him this access. We like to see that the access is granted. And then we like to see that that's actually what happened. Those are wonderful scenarios. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen near as much. I actually find a lot of my job is negotiation or we're going back and forth. Like, I don't feel like this control is operating. The client does. How do we talk through this to make sure that we're on the same page? We don't want to lose them as a client, but we have to also call this a deficiency if, if it is an actual problem, right? Sometimes it's like this, where it's like, hey, this is an issue. They're like, no, it's not an issue because of here's an explanation. And then we reason with that. A lot of negotiation goes into being a control uh, an IT auditor. Go ahead. So how much of an auditor is like, like nitty gritty? How much of an auditor is just like understanding the process and making sure the process is working correctly? Because I can see like within this one, like the process is working correctly, but it's not necessarily what's it like what you would expect to see like as an auditor. But I feel like yeah, just like what's the difference in an auditor like? Perfect. And that's a great question. How much is of each? Uh, it's hard to say because at the end of the day, this is why they call it risk assurance, is because if they see a scenario like this, you sit back and you think, what's the risk? Okay, so this employee that is getting new access, what's the risk? There's, they're getting an approval. I guess maybe the system admin might not know what James Golden's access is, but he can see it. Um, and so that's your job as a risk assurance professional is to assess. Here's something I don't really expect. So is that a problem or not? We start with the risk level, we go to the process level, and we finish out. Um, it happens fairly often. Yeah, I don't think it's often it's straightforward. So it just like seems like this where you think it's like a problem and they're just like being very vague, but it ends up not being a problem because it's just like pretty straightforward. And and another and that's true. IT auditing is much more vague than financial auditing. Financial auditing is like there's thirty thousand dollars missing, you better find it or you're going to jail. Right? <laughs> this is like, hey, you don't have an approval and they're like, uh, I kinda do. And then you're like, uh, you kinda do. You know, so so then you sign off on it, okay? Okay, so yeah, yes, the requester can be the approver, and also yes, they can just say just set them up like James, and we'll call it good. That's all right as well, because the approval more or less occurred. Okay, scenario three. Oh, I'm gonna let you read it.
Okay, here's another sample selection. They don't even have a ticket. You just see that they were granted access. They were hired in October. They got access. And you're like, where's your ticket? They're like, oh, the manager was out of town. But we do have an email from him before he got the access. He was hired. He got the access on October 15th. And look, you can see this email. It's his approval on October 10th, five days before he got the access. Is that okay? Okay. Any other thoughts? Go ahead. My thought is, is like, why are we putting so much trust on the ticketing system if approval is what's important and if email fulfills that purpose even though it's kind of odd to have approval? So why do we even care about the ticketing system? I mean, it fulfills a purpose, you know, that it works most of the time and it fulfills that requirement, but is that really what we care about? Is that it's done exactly in the ticketing system? Okay. Or in email or yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I have a feeling of like, depending on like if it's a work email or a personal email, if you have like access to that email and can get like, a copy of it, I don't know what procedures are with that. Okay. With the only access. Okay, so if it's a personal email, but they forward it to you. So it's like personal, personal email forwarded to his work email, forwarded to you, and you can see, okay. Yeah, there's a chain here, we can see this. He approved it as on his personal email. Do you think that would that be okay? My is yes. Okay. Um, I don't think that works because you know can get the way it's doing. And like I understand, yeah, we got the approval and like you can go back and see it. But I feel like if you give leeway on the list, then you're going to get leeway on the ticket in general, which I think is a very dangerous thing. Ah, so you've already picked up on this. It's like, if we say that this is okay, then we're just opening a can of worms where every year they have stuff all over and it takes us 30 years to get this audit done. That's a very good point. And actually that is a consideration with the, frequently as I, as I do these audits. I'm like, I don't wanna say this is okay simply because I don't want them to do it again, right? <laughs> but the, the answer here is that it's okay. As long as we can see that there was documented approval and as long as their control doesn't specify that it has to be a ticket from the ticketing system, which maybe it does. Um, as long as we can see that the approval was there, we're okay because the risks were mitigated. The manager still looked at it. I mean, like at the end of the day, the difference between a ticket approval and an email approval, we're still making sure that they have limited access and that the manager knows what that is. And so we're okay with it typically. Go ahead. If there was a rule within the company, and no approval is an approval without going through the ticketing system, would that email be accepted? Ooh, good question. So may maybe if the ticket says no other form of communication besides the ticket. Right. Now, there might be a circumstance where that is the case. And if, if they're explicit like that in their, in their control, ultimately we're just auditing the control. However you have it worded, then, then maybe we would call it an exception. Um, and... When they start fighting on you, it then right. then you might be like, eh, hey, fine, change your control. You know, let's let's, let's make this what it actually is. And, and so, and actually, we have a scenario similar to this. Uh, I was working as an internal auditor with Deloitte, and and the control didn't even specify. They didn't have a ticket for a control, but the control still operated. And I, I was able to prove that the control operated, but Deloitte's like, that's that's a deviation from the process. Therefore, we're calling an exception. And I said, I don't think it's an exception. So where I'm not calling an exception, you guys feel free. Kind of crazy, right? Anyway, things get kind of nitty gritty out there a little bit. Yeah. Okay, okay. So um, when we are testing, we want to see that the controls operate, okay? Um, first, you have the design, which is, what is your process? We want to see that that process is actually occurring throughout the audit period. You know, January through December, did you actually follow this process? So we'll select a sample of, we'll say it's 25, and we'll take a couple from each month, make sure that 
that was working in January as well as July and December. Um, now, if, there's an, if there was a deviation from the control, they didn't have a ticket, they didn't get approval, then that's an exception. That's an exception to the control. That's when they did not follow. Yes. Exceptions are bad. Um, they also are called deviations. Deviations from the controls are bad. Um, Sometimes you'll use softer words like finding. We found that it was a problem. You know, depends on who you are. I like to just call them exceptions. Like, no, you guys messed up. Okay. Uh, we are almost out of time. Should we do one more or should we call it? Not, we have three minutes. We have three minutes. We're going to do one more. Okay. Susie's manager. She's always pulling this stuff. So she had a new hire, no ticket, no email, can't find anything. You go and talk to her and she's like, I, did, I actually did approve that access. You can see that it's appropriate in the system. Okay? How about this one? Is this okay? If you record her and you keep it in your file, you're like, hey, we have her on record saying that she did approve this October 10th. Bonnie saying no. Anyone want to disagree? You want to disagree? Okay. And that, that's the theme, right? That's what we've been saying, okay? All right, so the answer here is no, that's not okay. They have to have something, okay? And the reason being is because we can't prove it. As an auditor, you need more than just inquiry. So this really becomes an, uh, an, an inquiry thing. Um, where uh, as an auditor, we say, look, sure, they might say that it was going okay, but we can't prove it. If we have a ticket, if we have an email or something, we can prove that this audit process was working, or that this control process was working, but in this case, we can't prove it. All we have is her saying this, you did it, therefore, if you want to listen to her, then go ahead, okay? But yes, this is our first no scenario. And then we're out of time. We'll get to our other scenarios and we'll jump in some other controls. So thanks for coming, guys. I will hang around if you have any questions.